Well, thanks so much for joining me, Patrick. Really excited to chat with you. Um, yeah, thanks for being on. Yeah, Daniel, thanks for having me on here. And I'm excited to talk about this topic today. And it's always a fun one. And uh, I appreciate being here. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, before we get into the topic today, which is talking about content creation and you know writing content and copy, um, why don't you share with uh, with the listeners you know a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and you know share your story. Like why why do you do what you do? Sure. Yeah. Um, my name is Patrick Casal. I am in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm a licensed clinical mental health counselor and addiction specialist here. I own a group psychotherapy practice, Resilient Mind Counseling. Um, I also am the owner of a different business, All Things Private Practice, the host of the All Things Private Practice podcast, host international and domestic entrepreneurial retreats all over the world, and just started a second podcast called Divergent Conversations, which is all about autistic ADHD adult life experience with a colleague of mine, Dr. Megan Neff. Um, why do I do what I do? So a lot of, you know, as a lot of helpers, I think we can all relate that we probably got into this field to heal ourselves through the work that we're doing, or at least have been in therapy or the helping profession and found it beneficial. And I was just telling you before we hit record, you know, like I've been in Asheville now for almost 12 years, which feels really, <laughs> that's a third of my life, which feels unreal. But uh, I'm from upstate New York. And the reason I moved here was impulsivity, like running from my life. I had a massive, massive gambling addiction. Uh, for about 10 years of my life and basically was at the last straw moment of like, I've got to change everything or this is not going to end well. Like life was going up mm -hmm. in flames for sure. Wow. So I had visited Asheville once and was like, you know, change my scenery, change my surroundings, run from my problems. They probably won't follow me, you know, 12 mm -hmm. hours away <laughs> and uh, <laughs> didn't have a job, didn't know anyone, just rented an apartment and moved down here with my dog at the time. And, uh, you know, 12 years later, it's really, it feels surreal, you know, having gambled since June of two, uh, 2012. And wow. um, it's been a, it's been a really cool experience. And then, you know, I, I started a private practice back in 2017. I just wanted to leave my agency job as so many of us do. And, um, you know, that was my end point. I think in a lot of ways, I was like, I'm going to get out of my agency job. I'm going to take this risk, take this leap, start a private practice. That's going to be it. That's like, that's the pinnacle for therapists. And, you know, I think my ADHD was like, no, it's boring once you kind of figure <laughs> it out. So here we are with like three different businesses later, but um, I've always really enjoyed helping the helpers. Like uh, that's why I started all things private practice to help people step away from their agency jobs or their group practices to start their mm -hmm. own, to take risks, to feel empowered, to work through the self-doubt and limiting beliefs and imposter syndrome. And I found myself doing that in Asheville for coffee and lunch for a long time. And sorry to all of you who have paid me a substantial amount of money since that time. <laughs> but I, I had major imposter syndrome of like, why would anyone hire me to do this thing? Like when yeah. Allison for year, who's a friend of mine, lives in Asheville and has a big audience, like why would anyone hire me? And um, I kept myself small for a long time. And then right before COVID launched all things private practice and the last two and a half years have been pretty surreal. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I did spend some time on your website, um, you know, just leading up to this conversation and just seeing how you 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 do a lot of coaching around imposter syndrome. And I, I love that because it it is a it's a big it's a big part of you know most people's journeys when it comes to entrepreneurship, you know, and building a business. And I'd love to hear more as we kind of get into our topic today of like, you know, content writing of like, maybe we can kind of talk about imposter syndrome as well as content writing, because I know that all, that can also be like a hurdle. Like, how do I write content for my website and my marketing when maybe I don't actually believe, you know, what in my value or, you know, or, or what I'm offering? Absolutely. Yeah. They go hand in hand. I think, um, you know, when we start experiencing that imposter syndrome, there's vulnerability in putting yourself out there and being authentic and using your real, your, your real perspective, your real voice. And I think for a lot of therapists, you know, both in grad school and community mental health, you're kind of conditioned to believe that you have to speak a certain way. You have to present a certain way. You can't be authentic. You can't curse in your content. You can't share real life examples. And, you know, I, I curse a lot and I'm going to censor myself today, <laughs> but, um, in reality, I think that relatability is accessibility, especially mm -hmm. when we're talking about marginalized groups of people who have maybe either never been to therapy or 
they are really looking for someone who gets it. And that's really what people want, right? It's like, they want to yeah. know you get it. They don't want you to be a walking DSM. Um, most people don't know what most of the terminology means that a lot of mental health practitioners use. So yeah. a lot of my focus has been trying to work through those, those blocks and barriers to say like, the more real you can be within reason, right? Like we're not disclosing our entire life story, but right. the more likely you are going to attract that niche, that ideal client population. If you want to have a private pay practice, all the things. So I, I do think those things go hand in hand for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and that was one thing that I noticed about your marketing, just spending some time on your website, but following you for a few months now on, on, in, on Instagram and just following your, your journeys, uh, around the world as you just got back from that massive trip. Um, but yeah, and I could, I could tell like, okay, yeah, he's just the, the way that he's, he speaks, he's being authentic and sharing and, you know, and swearing and, and that is, that is unique because sometimes, like you said, people do censor themselves or, you know, maybe feel like I'm not really putting myself fully out there. And it can feel, I know this is, I'm kind of just speaking from my own experience with my own marketing. It could feel like you're not being true to yourself. And that kind of creates a little like disconnect between what you're doing and who you're trying to reach. Um, and almost like a, I guess like a lack of peace in my marketing is kind of what I'm, yeah. what I'm thinking or kind of what I experienced when I was kind of doing that. And it's something that I think I still struggle with today. Like, you know, how do I, how do I present myself and share myself in a way that feels authentic and also connects with the people I want to connect with? Yeah, that's such a good point. And I think that when we're not doing that, it feels somewhat disingenuous, not only to ourselves, but our clients are are pretty receptive and perceive that when we're not acting in alignment with our values and we don't feel authentic about the content we're creating, that's where the passion and the the magic and the creativity and the, the fire goes away when you're just like, mm. okay, I've got to write this content about therapy for anxiety or therapy for depression. I've got to use all these buzzwords, right? And we also know keywords are obviously very, very important for ranking purposes, yeah. but like, I don't want my content to speak like a DSM. I don't want my content to feel like everybody else's because what I realized early on, like, I think our niche is a version of us. I really do believe that. And yeah. I think that evolves over time. Like, I think that whatever you decide your ideal client population is today, that doesn't mean it's going to be that six months from now, two years from now, yeah. et cetera. But if it is a version of us, we know how to write content that speaks directly to that client's pain points and lived experiences because you've had a version of that in your life. So when yeah. I started out, I was working mainly with young men who were struggling with addiction, which is a version of myself. And I was playing it like ultra professional, really buttoned up, all the buzzwords. Mm -hmm. I will walk alongside you and I'm a trauma therapist who specializes <laughs> in A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this doesn't feel good for me. I'm not attracting clients who are coming in the door where I feel really energized and excited to be doing this work. So yeah. I made some shifts. I had this like light bulb epiphany moment, rewrote all my content uh, really authentically, used the F word quite a few times. <laughs> um, and I just remember starting to get calls and email inquiries where it was young adult men who were like, finally, someone who I know I can be myself with. Because I think- yeah. That so often when you're looking for help, you're going to feel some perceived judgment until you establish rapport and relationships. So yeah. it's almost a way of breaking down that barrier before you even meet that client. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably so exciting. Like when you start getting those clients in and, and kind of on the other side of the conversation, you, st you get to be yourself too. Like, you know, then they come in for that first session and you don't have to um, impress them. You don't have to stay buttoned up. You know, it's like, you're already on that same level because you've already been speaking their language. Um, and they're speaking your language. And so it's just kind of like, okay, let's sit down and let's do the work. Absolutely. And it, it, it creates almost instantaneous rapport and trust. So yeah. that way you don't have to go through like all the the meaningless artificial conversation to get to the deeper stuff. Yeah. And if I was able to disclose a little bit in my content on my web pages, on my social media, whatever, that I've experienced addiction, 
and I've worked through it, but I knew the hell that it was, the experience of being actively addicted to something, how torturous that was and how you push everyone away and you disconnect and you do things that you never thought you were possible of doing or capable of doing and all the things that come with it, the desperation, et cetera. Those clients are then like, you get it. And I trust that you can help me because yeah. you're kind of trying to highlight that there is a light at the end of the tunnel because you want to instill some semblance of hope, right? Like otherwise, what are we doing this for? And I think yeah. therapists often forget that this work is relational and there's no better way to build a relationship than sharing a little bit of your own story to help the client on the other end who may be fearful about picking up the phone or emailing yeah. or has never done this before. Yeah. And one question that comes to mind is what about the folks that, you know, are passionate about maybe helping a population um, that isn't necessarily a part of their story? You know, like maybe they haven't gone through addiction, but they do like working with those types of clients. What's kind of a good starting point for someone to write authentic copy um, that is, it's going to be probably be less about their story and more about, um, you know, less about the therapist's story and more, you know, focused on the client. What would you, what kind of tips would you have for that? Yeah. So something I do in my coaching programs and whenever we're doing niche, uh, the week where we narrow down our niche and, um, we're writing content is we start with stuff that's basic, like anxiety, trauma, depression, right? Those are the main three that always come to mind for people. And to simply say like, my niche is trauma. That's not specific enough. Uh, my niche is depression, not specific enough. And what I ask people to do to start writing captivating content is to get in a different mind frame and headspace for content creation. So what we do is we open up a Google doc. We use, let's just say, Daniel, you have depression. I have trauma. Someone else has anxiety. What I want everyone to do is take five to 10 minutes to brain dump everything they can think of that someone may be experiencing when they're struggling with trauma or depression or anxiety without using the words trauma, depression, anxiety, mm. really trying to convey and create a list of pain points and lived experiences of what is it like to struggle with these disorders that some people don't even know how to put that into language. And again, if you surround yourself with mental health practitioners, we speak in a language that most people don't use this jargon. And even yeah. something as simplistic as the word depression or anxiety, I think most therapists can say, I've had a client who was unbelievably anxious, obviously meets criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. I told the client that and they're like, I don't have anxiety. But then if you were able to like break it down and okay, racing thoughts, irrational thinking, always thinking worst case yeah. scenario, um, tightness in your chest when you're driving, whatever the case may be, then it's like, oh yeah, that is anxiety. Okay. So let's speak like that. Let's use relatable examples of real life experience. And I think that really helps you start to be more creative, but also significantly more relatable. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. I like what you said about describing it without using the words. And I think that that can be, that's such a good, a good exercise. And likely too, I think for people listening, especially if you've been you know established for some time now, you likely have those types of clients coming to you and like, you can think back, like, how did they describe it? You know, especially like that first session when you're sitting with them, like, you know, okay, why, why are you, why are we starting therapy? Like describe what's going on, kind of paying attention to the language that they use, you know, the words that they use. And sometimes too, I even encourage people go back. Maybe you have some time in your day after you've had a you know, uh, uh, that first session, go back and write down some of the words that they use, some of the language that they use, and you can pull from that for your, uh, you know, for your website content in the future. Yeah, that's, that's a great suggestion. And I think that's really um, what it's all about is what language are the people using who are coming to you? Not what language are you using in your professional circles? Because those are very different types of conversations, right? So yeah, again, like, really trying to break disorders or diagnoses or struggles down in layman's terms. And then taking it a step further, what we do is then we start to make it relatable and creative. So we don't want to just say like, you know, I see a lot of this. I do a lot of website auditing and I imagine that you do as well. But what I see on psychology today profiles and websites is like bullet point, bullet point, bullet, bullet point. I, yeah. I want people to really express what it's like to struggle with these things and a way that we kind of get into that creative headspace is 
sometimes I ask my coaching clients to take a favorite movie character or TV show character and describe why they would be picking up the phone to come to therapy. So I'm a big Game of Thrones fan, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. And I can say like, okay, if this character was picking up the phone to come to therapy, what would they be coming for? What would they be experiencing? What would they be struggling with? It really helps you get into this playful, creative space to get out of the headspace of like, I don't know how to create content. I don't know how to write copy for my website. That's really not true. Like, it just really is about trying to do things differently and have a different part of your brain activated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which side note, I saw on your Instagram, uh, some stuff about Lord of the Rings and uh, you met you met the actor who played Sauron. Was that it? Yeah, that was probably top five life experience. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, he's into Lord of the Rings too. This is my guy. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that was so unexpected. And I think, you know, I could talk about traveling that <laughs> unlocks all day, but yeah, yeah. I, I, that was very cool. So a, again, that would be a cool creative exercise to say like, okay, if Sauron, the dark Lord of Lord <laughs> of the Rings was coming to therapy, why would he be picking up the phone? And like, yeah, I think it allows for you to start using imagery in your content and mm-hmm. metaphor. And I think that kind of goes above and beyond like the basic, like spitting out uh, just the same stuff over and over. Because what I see a lot of, and I say this a lot, a lot of people's stuff looks the same. So if you're going to try yeah. to differentiate or stand out from everybody else, it cannot look like I'm a trauma-informed therapist who will walk alongside you and I use IFS, CBT, a- ACT, EMDR. Most people do not know what that means. Like you have to really try to get into a headspace where it is okay for you to be relatable. Yeah, absolutely. I like I like that like the exercises and stuff like that. I think are super helpful because there's a reason why so many websites look the same because most people, they don't spend the time doing something creative like that. And they just know I need, I need this on my website and this is, this is the service or this is the person I'm trying to reach. Um, and to your point too, like, yeah, we look at tons of websites for, for assessing and, you know, a lot of, especially a lot of folks who come to us for SEO, you know, it's kind of, we always assess the website, do an audit of the website. And usually 99% of the time, really the biggest mistake is you don't have enough content on the website to um, to both rank for keywords and SEO, but also to really, like you said, connect with you know that ideal client. And I think that when it comes to copywriting, there's this sort of, there needs to be this beautiful marriage between you know the keywords that are important, but the keywords might bring people to the website, but it's really the copy and it's what you're talking about, the creativity, the relatability, that's really going to help you stand out and then connect with people once they get to the website. Exactly. And if we think about attention spans, right? Like how much time do people really spend on a website yeah. before they decide to move on? Three to five seconds, maybe. If you're not drawing them in, if you're not connecting with what they're experiencing or what they want help with, they're just moving on to the next one. And I think that it means that, and I think a lot of therapists and mental health professionals really think of content creation and copywriting as like this laborious chore, like, and I almost have resistance to like, I don't want to do this. Like, I don't want to mm. have to create content. I don't yeah. know how I feel overwhelmed. And that makes sense. Like we did not get a lot of business training in school mostly. So it makes sense why there's resistance. But if you're looking at it much more from a pace of place of passion and creativity, it doesn't really feel like a chore. It feels really exciting. Once you can start freeing yourself and liberating yourself from like, I have to operate within this box and this confine, because if you're able to start expressing yourself, sharing a little of your story, using real life examples, being relatable, it doesn't feel the same way as just like, Ugh, I have to write my depression services page, or I have to write my trauma page. Like, I don't know yeah. what to say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And another thing that comes to mind too with that is when you do take the time to do this stuff, it helps you understand your client, like your ideal client who you're trying to reach better because you're kind of getting in that headspace and kind of thinking about the things that they're thinking about, the challenges they're facing. Um, and it also helps you to kind of have a... Uh, sort of a a bank of those stories or bank of just words and language to use, you know, when you start talking to those, to those clients. So I know for me, like when I have, when I do copywriting for my own website, it it just helps me understand, you know, it's like, okay, we're doing this new service. 
what's the pain point, you know, that somebody might be going through. Um, and so it helps me just kind of get a better framework of how, how do I speak about these challenges? Absolutely. And I think some tips I can give for you all that are listening, like there, there are so many things we could explore right now, but if you're feeling really stuck and stagnant, and this feels really challenging, get out of your typical environment. So I believe Mm -hmm. that like new environments create creativity or spark creativity. So that could mean like pick up your laptop, go to a coffee shop, go to a park, go somewhere where you can be in a different environment because it's really, for those of you who work from home, like myself, it's hard to create in this office. Like I'm in here podcasting, I'm in here working, like it's hard to switch gears. So that's one suggestion I would have. And another one would be like you were just mentioning, if you want to create like a resource bank or a bunch of statements or examples or keywords or um, a bunch of copy, really to brain dump and free associate, like keep a journal or keep a Google doc where you can just put information in there when it hits you, because we can't force ourselves to be creative. When that creative energy comes over, use it, like run with it and then really start brain dumping into it so that you can go back and then you can start pulling and saying like, Ooh, I really like that. Or like, Ooh, that's not as good of an idea as I thought it was, which I do a lot of. So, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point too. Like it, it also doesn't have to all happen at once. Like I'm a big fan and it's just maybe how I work. I like to do the brain dump stuff first, then come back and refine. Um, and that could even be just like, you know, when it comes to podcast topics, you know, just brain dump of podcast topics. Here's all the stuff I can talk about. And then at a different time choosing, okay, this is kind of what I'm really excited to talk about. So let's choose this topic, you know, and then you kind of, you get it out of, you get your first brain dump of the topic out and then maybe you come back and you refine it later and it can kind of, that process, the creative process can take some time and you'll be in a different headspace or a different creative space each time you kind of touch those things. And that's just kind of part of it to get it to where you feel like it really belongs. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no perfect process for this. And that's something yeah. that is an imposter syndrome uh, uh, symptom is perfectionism. And that's what I see a lot of is like, I can't release my website yet because it's not perfect. And it's like, well, mm-hmm. it's never going to be. Yeah, And you can always make edits and improvements and tweaks. And mm-hmm. I think that present and existent is better than non-existent. Like you have to yeah. be able to be found, right? So you could have the crappiest website on earth with the worst copying content, which I did when I first started because I didn't know what I was doing. And, but at least I could share the link with people if they were like, do you have more information? And I think a lot of therapists get into that imposter syndrome, perfectionism mindset of, I can't publish this yet because it's not perfect or it doesn't look the way I want. I don't love the picture on page two. Like who cares? Just put it out there and then you can edit it because putting it out there is an action step that breaks you out of that like perfectionism, imposter syndrome mindset of once it's perfect, I'll release it. But that is just a preventative measure. That's Mm -hmm. just you kind of like saying my anxiety is so much that I cannot release this to the world. And then the odds of it actually happening decrease significantly. So action steps all the time, like imperfect action is how I kind of run all of my businesses. Yeah, that's a good point. And that kind of goes along with those, like the process, the creative process too. Like getting it live is one thing coming back and editing changing later on like yeah i totally i'm totally with you on that and i i it, it drives me crazy sometimes when people just don't launch the website you know it kind of it stalls us out you know and we're creating a website and they're like oh wait i just need this extra page or this one thing or this one thing this one thing and like yeah but you don't, you have no website at the moment and you know your clients don't know you exist google doesn't know you exist and it takes time for Google to catch up with your website. It also likes older websites that have been established. So like get it out, get it live and you can always tweak and move forward from there. Absolutely. I mean, that, that's something I live, I swear by like build the plane as you fly it, so to speak, because like otherwise it just lives up here. And when it's up here in your head and it's just an idea, it stays an idea and it never becomes reality. And you can't help the people that you're hoping to serve. You can't get your business out there. And it does take time. I think for you, I imagine there's, you know, if you don't understand the SEO or ranking process, it's like, how come my website isn't on Google yet? Or how come it's not page one? And it, it takes six months really to get good SEO strategy. Like, so really just 
constant blogging and content creation. And one thing I would say to anyone listening is like, if you feel like you look at your schedule, I don't know where I could create content. My schedule's so busy. I'd, I can't add another task. Mm-hmm. One hour a week, like just plug it in and have consistency around it. One hour a week, create content. Whether that means blog content, whether that means social media content, whether that means web copy, and they can all be interchangeable too. So you don't have to like recreate the wheel, but really try to get into that mindset of this is something I do on a weekly basis because otherwise what happens is like, it's a set it and forget it process where you're like, I did it this one time. I don't have time to do this again. And and yeah. this really is a process where there needs to be tweaks and revisements and improvements along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, as we wrap this up, Patrick, is there, is there any, um, any last tip, any last uh, thing you want to leave people with when it comes to creating authentic content? I just want to reiterate that I do believe that relatability is accessibility Mm -hmm. and that the more relatable you can be just giving yourself permission to embrace authenticity and you will see the difference and not only the clients that are contacting you, but as you were alluding to before, Daniel, like just the way you feel about your marketing and your content creation change and shift. And that will create this positive energy and momentum where you're feeling really good about the business that you've designed. It's not, you haven't recreated your agency job environment that you so desperately wanted to get away from. So like really giving yourself permission to be yourself and I know how scary that is. I know there's vulnerability in that, but I also promise you that clients are looking for people who get it. And I cannot tell you how many comments and DMs and messages I get for coaching now, not for my, for my practice as well, but more so like you were able to say something that I'm thinking all the time and it makes me feel so much more comfortable working with you. So like really just trying hard to work through that imposter syndrome to put yourself out there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, these are really good, really good uh, tips and exercises, Patrick. Thanks so much. I know that I'm, it's got me thinking, you know, I want to go back and look at my website and how can I be more authentic, put more myself into it. So I appreciate, appreciate having you on and uh, connecting with you. I want you let everybody know where they can uh, find you if they want to uh, work with you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. So there are a couple of different places right now. You can go to allthingspractice.com. That's my website. It has my retreat information, podcast information. The All Things Private Practice podcast is on all major platforms. You can join my Facebook group, All Things Private Practice. And you can also listen to Divergent Conversations, which is a new podcast that I mentioned before. That's all about adult ADHD, autistic uh, life experience. And that is on all major platforms as well. Awesome. And we'll put all that stuff in the show notes for everybody to check that out. Thanks so much, Patrick. It's been great hanging out. Yeah. Have a great week. Take care.